good morning um, for some of us who are in Korea and uh, good evening for those that may be in Palo Alto. It's a great pleasure to speak to you today. Um, as as so you was saying, I'm currently, uh, my day job is the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer of uh, the Green Climate Fund. What I would like to do today is to walk you through a presentation that provides you with the background of how we operate, that provides you with the main theory of change of what we would like to address with our investments, and give you a few examples, but mostly engage with Q&A from you all. So please, uh, as I present, if you have any questions, keep them ready, and I'd like to have an engaging conversation. Any questions could be asked. Uh, the idea is to, to have that exchange as I was, I was saying. So um, I'm gonna now pull up the presentation and um, and just if someone gives me a thumbs up that this is uh, visible and I'm audible, I will proceed. Thank you, KT. Um, so um, the main sort of focus of the Green Climate Fund is to be a green market accelerator. So we're here to accelerate investments and innovation uh, in, in climate. Um, we, uh, I believe it's, it goes without saying that the, the, the crisis that we are facing with climate, it's, it's just possibly the uh, most uh, important uh, challenge that humanity is facing because it compounds other potential crises. And if we look at the recent report from the IPCC, uh, here I'm presenting a summary that somehow background has been uh, recently confirmed by the leaders, the lead scientists globally, right? And that is that the human induced global warming is changing at unprecedented ways, um, that adaptation measures can effectively build resilience, but the financing adaptation is not yet at scale. Um, then there is a high likelihood of temperature rise reaching the 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2023 and 2040. And this is something that we've never seen. Um, and this is indeed why the Paris Agreement came into place. Um, we have also seen the climate is not just um, uh, uh, an issue related to science, it's an issue related to human and social. And this is actually exacerbating inequities uh, that could really make it difficult to really transition into a just and, and, and equitable way. Um, and then that both finance uh, for mitigation and adaptation must increase. It must increase in quantum. Uh, and this is why the Green Climate Fund exists because we are here to crowd in uh, more public and private capital. So um, just some background in case not everyone is familiar with the Green Climate Fund. Um, we were set up by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, uh, the famous entity that holds the COPs every year, as you know. And in 2015, we were recognized to serve the Paris Agreement as one of their financing measures. So operationally, we started our transactions in 2015 when COP21 took place. Um, we work only in developing countries. And as Soyun was mentioning, we are trying to support both mitigation to do that transition to low emission economy and also adaptation in order to hopefully provide people with more resilience. Um, but as we grow, and we are only one of many players in the climate architecture, we would like to serve as a hub of the climate finance landscape. Today, we are the largest multilateral climate fund, um, and we would like to be that hub of, of, of climate finance. Now, let me give you some characteristics of our operations because we have a model that I think is unique in some ways, but complex as well. Uh, and, um, and this is, um, we are country driven which means that uh, the programs that we are approving are programs that have to relate to countries and have to relate to how those countries are meeting their national determined contributions or NDCs. 
Uh, we also support countries in their policy de-risking. So we are also trying to strengthen the, the um, enabling environment at the country level. Uh, and we use uh, what we call readiness programs to support country planning and create investment planning at countries. Our goal is that countries are able to, tra to translate their NDCs into actual investment plans with bankable projects. Um, we are uh, what sometimes people call capital agnostic, meaning we're a fund that could use a range of financial instruments to leverage, and we are at best a, a core blended finance layer. So our capital is public. We get resources from contributors. Most of them are contributors from developed countries. Uh, and uh, those contributors are uh, you know, replenishing the fund every four years. And then we try to use that uh, in, in the best way possible. We are currently uh, in the second replenishment that we hope will help us uh, fundraise for the 2020, 2024 to 2027 programming cycle. Um, we are a patient capital, so we are a long-term investor. We're able to take higher risk than commercial investors and even other development investors. And this definitely distinguishes us because uh, from a risk appetite, we are more focused on the long-term impact and the possibility of crowding in and de-risking. Uh, and therefore we're able to take first loss positions, and I'll be giving a few examples in a moment. Now, uh, on the bottom of this graph, uh, we also are clarifying that we are a, an open partnership organization. So we're not making investments directly ourselves. We work through a network of entities that go through a very thorough due diligence and accreditation process. And these entities vary from NGOs like Conservation International, to national governments, to um, UN agencies like UNDP or UNEP, multilateral development banks like the World Bank or the Development Bank of Brazil, uh, all the way to private sector entities like uh, BNP Paribas or private equity organizations like Pegasus or impact investors like Acumen. So we are working with 114 entities that have been accredited and they bring the projects to us and they execute the projects uh, at the country level. Lastly, we are mandated by the COP to keep a balanced allocation between adaptation and mitigation. Um, they would like us to keep a 50-50 balance uh, from a grant equivalency perspective. So these are some of the characteristics of how we work. Now, um, our theory of change at the moment, uh, this is based on our carrying programming. So we would like to drive change, as I mentioned, by first providing that policy de-risking and establish a, an enabling environment for act, attracting more climate solutions and climate finance. We have seen that countries have barriers that does not allow finance, financial flows to come into country. So we would like to hopefully help those countries overcome some of those barriers and make it a lot easier for uh, capital to actually flow uh, in, the, in this much needed area. We also want to catalyze innovation at all levels. So not only innovation on technology, which we do. So we, for example, have been funding technology transfer uh, solutions for adaptation. We recently uh, approved a project where we are creating incubators and accelerators for climate uh, with academic institutions in Mexico and in Ivory Coast to serve the Latin American region and the West Africa region. Uh, and we did this through GIZ, which is a German technical assistant entity. Uh, we also like innovation on business model, meaning we also like to go to projects that are really trying to, to innovate at the business model level. So for us, also uh, is on the, on the financial structures. So we recently approved at the board um, last, uh, last October, a transaction where we are creating a green guarantee company. 
and a green guarantee company uh, is is exactly to allow countries to be able to um, I'll be putting my slides in a second to be able to uh, access capital. So the the driver of innovation is indeed something that we want to sort of do uh, at all levels, not just on the technological side, as I just mentioned. Um, the third uh, important column or vertical of how we operate in our model is around um, the blended finance. So here our goal is how do we de-risk and mobilize finance at scale? This is very important because uh, we at the GCF, as I said, we have a high risk appetite and the risk statement of our board is indeed that we're here as a catalyzer, uh, that we're here to create markets, uh, but at the same time, we're able to write large ticket sizes. So sometimes we make investments that could vary from 10 million all the way to $250 million. So this uh, allows us that sometimes we're able to do transactions that go above one or $2 billion. We would like to now also go into what we call investment platforms, where we would also be able to somehow, you know, fund the um, sort of proof of principle of an investment platform and mobilize hopefully resources at the 20 or 30 billion. Because here, as you know, the need is great. So we need to move the billions to trillions. So we would like to play a role there. Lastly, we are also very keen to work at the local level. So we would like to work with the local financial institutions, national SME banks, microfinance banks, any entity that is also trying to green their operations and provide local solutions for climate. Now, um, where we are in regards to our portfolio, so we have committed $12 billion. So as I said, we are a young organization. We've been operating since 2015, even though we were created about 10 years ago. But from, a, from COP21, where we did our first transaction and fast forwarding this to March 2023, when we held our last board meeting, we committed $12 billion across 216 projects. And the co-financing that we aim to attract in those transactions will bring our portfolio to a total value of $45 billion. So as you can see, we have uh, a multiplier of about one to three. Uh, and with this, uh, we, we are able to, to sort of leverage uh, public and private capital. While this is indeed a large portfolio for a climate uh, only fund, um, it's still small for the need that we have. Remember that at COP, the mandate was to mobilize $100, million, $100 billion a year. That was the big ask. And we represent 3% of that because we mobilize somewhere around two to $3 billion a year. Uh, so, but we, you know, that's accounting for all the uh, climate finance that um, are, is Paris aligned. Now, we believe that our capital does have a unique sort of catalyzer role. So while we mobilize those 3 billion a year, that 3 billion a year has that sort of multiplier effect and, and, and that high risk that hopefully we'll be able to probably allow more capital. Now, if we look at our portfolio from, from, from how we are, um, you know, distributed, um, so, just to provide some context, um, there is this grant equivalency uh, target, and this is following OECD um, sort of uh, KPIs. Um, what that means is in the case of us, we would like to have a balance of 50-50 on grant equivalency. We're very close to that. At the moment, we are 51 adaptation and 49 mitigation. But if you look at the nominal value, mitigation is higher. 60% of our nominal portfolio has been allocated to mitigation and 40% to adaptation. Um, adaptation is, is, is a harder uh, or a newer area where we are somehow break, breaking ground. 
in some of the areas, you know, resilient infrastructure, early warning systems, all of those areas are newer, uh, nature-based solutions, whereas mitigation, as you know, especially in the renewable energy is the most developed sector. Regarding the uh, distribution across regions, um, we are equally distributed across Africa and Asia Pacific at 35% in Africa and 34% in, in, in Asia Pacific, followed by Latin America and the Caribbean at 28%, and Eastern Europe is currently at 3%. Now, the COP does ask us to focus on the vulnerable. And the most vulnerable is understood as countries that are considered the least developed countries, small island development states or SIDS and African states. So 64 of our capital is currently uh, allocated to those uh, vulnerable areas. Um, we work both with the public sector and the private sector. Um, at the moment, 65% of our resources are in the public sector and 35% in the private sector, but the private sector is growing and this is an area that we're also putting a lot of emphasis because we believe that here is where um, the, the, the scaling and the, and, the, and the crowding in could happen a lot more. From, a, from, from the financial instruments, we are equally split between grants and loans at 41%. But we're also increasing our private equity exposure at 10% for the moment, guarantees are 3%. We also have some resource-based payments. So as you can see, uh, we have, I would say, quite a, a nice mix, and, and this is going to continue uh, working. Across sectors, uh, in, the, in the top, those are the mitigation sectors that we're working. So we're working on energy gener generation and access. I think here, we have, we have a large portfolio in generation, and we're now trying to work a lot more in energy access. We're trying to work in mobility and transport, in building cities, industries, and appliances. So we also are working with the high emitter industries and helping them transition and become less of an emitter. And then we are also doing a lot of things in forest and land use, especially on carbon sequestration, red flux, and other matters. On the livelihoods and resiliency, we're trying to work also with, you know, how do we improve and help people's livelihoods become better uh, and the communities have better. So this could be from access to water, sanitation, and many other elements that are very important. Um, we also work closely in the nexus between climate and health, climate and food and, and, and security and water security. We also are working in what we call infrastructure and built environment here. It is to build a resilient infrastructure. So we recently approved uh, a private equity fund in Africa to exactly do that, focus in resilient, in resilient infrastructure. And then we're trying to work in biodiversity and, and net positive ecosystem solutions. So these are sort of the areas sometimes, as, as Soyun was saying, we work in cross-cutting uh, between mitigation and adaptation. So sometimes our projects are indeed uh, working across the board. You know, where do we place ourselves in the entire, let's say, funding infrastructure or climate finance infrastructure? So um, if you look at this chart, and let me just walk you through, because here we're trying to somehow map uh, certain, um, you know, climate funds or other funders with also the use of different financial instruments. So we see ourselves um, at, the, at, the, at the upper uh, quadrant uh, to the right. Um, and here is, uh, we are taking a lot more risk than the development financial institutions or DFIs, than the national development banks and the multilateral development banks, but maybe less than the philanthropies. Um, uh, but at the same time, we are also taking higher risks than the other climate funds. We have other climate funds that are uh, set up by other conventions, uh, like the Global Environmental Facility, Jeff. It is more a fund that serves the Rio COP and the Biodiversity COP. Uh, we also have the Adaptation Fund. And then also, not only are we taking higher risks, but we are also able to write larger people. Um, so, so we are, I would say, close to impact investors. Um, and maybe a little bit below philanthropies, 
but we you can see that we could play that catalytic role because our you know uh, network of executing entities and accredited entities are a mix of some of these players here. So I think we we are able to bring that. Overall, we're here to scale, to create markets, and to accelerate. Now, um, I mentioned already that we have the flexibility of working across a range of instruments. So I'm not going to uh, go over those. But the one thing I really wanted to provo provide a little bit of focus is blended finance. And blended finance, it is the use of finite public capital in a way they were able to you know, provide that high risk concessional capital. We are going to be able to mobilize private capital that is looking for a market return. Um, and the idea is that there is alignment between impact and return. So that is how we see the role. And, 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 and I believe that's sort of uh, the, the core of what we do. We are a blended finance provider. I already mentioned that we, you know, we've been growing, and now we're also uh, improving our implementation. So, you know, if, if this is only data as of December, but you know, we hope to reach uh, close to 13 billion in the next year. Uh, about, you know, 10 billion of that will already be under implementation. The disbursement is there is a bit of a lag because we also are investing in early stages. So the, the J curve of our investment uh, is indeed, there is a, a, a deeper uh, sort of uh, deep, a deeper drop uh, because it takes longer, but also we are going to some adaptive management because some of our projects have been impacted by the, by the COVID pandemic. But, but here we're focusing now a lot on increasing our disbursement. Um, lastly, I wanted just to provide a few examples here, uh, just to bring life to, to, to what we do. Uh, so here, these are some examples on adaptation. These are projects that we've done in Timor-Leste and Malawi. Um, this is examples of, of early warning systems. So this is indeed to support the most vulnerable. Um, so in the case of Timor-Leste, we are working with UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. This is a project that is grant-based where we are funding $21 million. And the idea is to enhance the early warning systems uh, by building hydrometeorological uh, solutions that would allow them to have more resilience um, in how they work. Uh, so, so this is one example. We have also have one of our earlier, earlier transaction was in Malawi. That was also, on, on scaling the use of modernized climate information and early warning systems. It was also with the United Nations, that was with the UNDP, um, and it was also grad-based. Um, now here, I'm giving you some examples on oceans because the whole blue economy is also something that we are working very closely. These are adaptation examples. But here we go, before we did single country projects here, we're showing you uh, two private sector projects that are multi-country. One is a, a project in the Western Indian Ocean that we did with KFW. KFW is the DFI or private sector development bank of Germany. Um, and here uh, it was indeed to, to somehow create a pool project uh, with NGOs on the, something that they call the Blue Action Fund. And this was to work on coastal zone management uh, in the ocean. And that covered Madagascar, South Africa, Mozambique, and Tanzania. The other one is quite a groundbreaking transaction because here is on how to uh, reduce the stressors of coral reefs by creating a blue economy that is somehow protecting coral reefs, you know, by either ecotourism or any uh, any infrastructure that would protect the coral reefs. This is done by Pegasus Capital Advisors, which is a US-based private equity firm. And here GCF provides $125 million of equity. And we are coming here as the first loss. So we are taking the highest risk tranche of the capital structure, hoping to raise $500 million and, and create that blue economy that protects the reefs. And here there are about 18 countries included in this project. Um, here, these two examples are also uh, public and private, 
<clears throat> this other one is, is also with Pegasus. Um, this subnational climate fund is actually focused in cities. 70% of the emissions are concentrated in cities across the globe. So the idea of this project is to help cities uh, make that transition and work. And this is working with municipalities, but also working with providers of services uh, across the cities. Uh, here, we also are providing a first loss of $150 million. Um, then we also work with IFAD. IFAD is the, um, an agricultural development agency based in Rome. And here we are creating what we call the Inclusive Green Finance uh, Initiative. And here is mostly helping farmers and farmer organizations and cooperatives um, you know, uh, work in the transition to climate. Uh, here there were 13 countries and here it was a mix of grants and loans. Um, and lastly, uh, these are, uh, this is the one company that I was talking to you about the Green Guarantee Company. This is actually a Japanese uh, accredited entity, MUFG Bank or, or Mitsubishi Bank. And here we're going to be providing, um, we provided the first tranche of this investment was 40 million, but we might be providing another 40 million to a total of 81.5. And here we are trying to create an institution. So here we are really taking an equity stake in the company uh, in order to allow uh, countries to mobilize more capital to their capital markets. A lot of the corporates in emerging markets are, um, there's a ceiling on the sovereign risk rating, but the idea is that they will overcome that ceiling by working through this company, they would have a triple B rating. So by having access to a triple B rating, even though the countries might have a junk rating, they will be able to access capital markets at better terms. So we're working with them and this is only going to be to fund green projects. Um, lastly, uh, we're working with EBRD on a, on a big energy uh, financing project in Egypt. Um, this is pretty much a project finance on renewable energy. And, and this is sort of to increase the, the, the transition and, and how Egypt is using cleaner uh, um, energy for, for their own country. So this gives you some of, 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 our, of, our, of a flavor of how we're working across all levels with small transactions uh, driven by UN agencies or NGOs, grant base, to larger transactions driven by commercial banks or private equity firms, to also working to VFIs and multilateral development. Um, here I'm leaving you uh, some links uh, for you to follow, but also there is uh, this uh, recent progress report that has a lot of visuals on how we are operating and what we've been able to achieve. And I would invite all of you to check it and also to be able to somehow uh, see how we operate. With this, I'm gonna pause and I'm now, I would like to open it up for questions and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. Apologies for the little uh, alarm glitch uh, that we had, but I think we've got another 25 or 30 minutes for questions. So thanks a lot and over to you all. Thanks all you, thanks Katie. Thank you. Glad that you didn't have to evacuate while <laughs> you're presenting. Uh, yeah, so now the floor is open for uh, questions. Any question from the audience? In the meantime, uh, I, I, if I may, I, I have questions. So, um, the it, it's interesting that you try to balance uh, the GCF portfolio between adaptation mitigation 50-50. And then um, I've been heard that adaptation project is extremely hard. And then uh, GCF is only a few uh, institution who is at, uh, you know, actively, you know, playing in this, um, this, uh, this uh, perspective. Uh, in more specific way, uh, I mean, first for the audience, what do you count as an adaptation project usually? And then what are the risks that you are seeing? And then is there any different way that GCFC that, oh, okay, this might be risk for, you know, private sector or in you know, a certain institution, but for us, you know, like if we are seeing uh, this dynamics and so on, or, you know, you're just doing just first uh, loss taking 
and um, and stay there to catalyze more investment to come in. Thank you, so you. Um, so given that we are able to take a lot of risk and we are able to also, you know, we, well, we want to do things that are commercially viable. We don't have an IRR or a target IRR. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility. So actually our um, adaptation pipeline is quite large. And as I said, if you look at the grant equivalency is almost 50-50, but even putting that aside, 40% nominal in adaptation already tells us that we're able to do a lot of this. The board approved an adaptation paper. We have also project preparation facilities that are mostly used for projects in adaptation to create baseline indicators, to create uh, certain tools that might be missing. So, so I don't think there would be an issue for us to somehow have a very dynamic pipeline in adaptation projects. However, what, do, what we really wanna make sure is that we're able to measure those adaptation results, which are mostly in our case around beneficiaries. So we're always trying to somehow have access on how livelihoods improved and resiliency improved at the beneficiary level. Um, and and as, as you know, we sometimes have cross-cutting projects uh, where a percentage of the project is mitigation, but then uh, part of it is also adaptation. We wanna make sure that this is truly uh, adaptation and not just uh, a nice sort of component just to say, oh, we're doing adaptation because a little bit the whole issue of greenwashing and how do we make sure that people are counting for what they need to accomplish. So, so I think this is, uh, we have a methodology to determine adaptation beneficiaries. Uh, we have a team that is also looking into that. All our projects go through an independent panel review before they are approved by the board and they are technical experts. They will also look into those uh, adaptation beneficiaries. So we do have certain, certain, you know, a number of filters to make sure that we are actually accounting things properly. Now, we are, as I mentioned, we're trying to work with the vulnerable. We're making the vulnerable a very clear target of what we do. And just by working with the vulnerable, we also need to provide solutions. And, and, and we've been doing a lot of locally led climate solutions in adaptation, where we're also working with indigenous knowledge. We just did a very good project in Vanuatu in the Pacific Islands with Save the Children Australia um, that had a very clear uh, project in community led adaptation. Um, and, and this is something that if we get it right, we will be able to replicate with certain, with, with certain adjustments across the board. So that's sort of how we see it. We see that um, we will be doing more in adaptation. We recently approved a new policy because you know I mentioned that we need to work through entities that go through an accreditation process. And we have 114 of those. Our accreditation process is very heavy. So it takes entities two to three years to get accredited uh, because there is an external panel, it's approved by the board, and, and it, it has a lot of steps. So we're now doing a project assessment accreditation, whereby we don't need to work only with entities accredited, but we look at projects. If the project has all our investment criteria, we might be able to fund them. And in this pilot, we're gonna have we're gonna try to do 10 projects a year for three years. If in those 30 projects that we're gonna be doing the next three years, adaptation is one of the priorities. So, so we are very, very focused on, on, this, uh, on this part. Um, I think there's a question from, from Raymond. Hi, Raymond, thank you. Um, so the question is, can you describe the short version of what you're looking for in clean energy sources? How can one connect one-on-one -on -one with you? Okay. On, the, on the clean energy, uh, energy is the area that we've done the most. So it is the sector that has been most heavily invested. Um, and we're working across the entire clean energy. So we work on, on large renewable projects like the one I just showed in, um, uh, in, in, in Egypt. Uh, we're also working with green hydrogen. We are exploring green hydrogen as this is sort of a new frontier in the energy mix. Uh, we also work in some areas uh, where, where we believe that 
um, the, the just transition. You know, we're working with countries like Indonesia or South Africa that are trying to go to a just transition. Uh, now, we are working, as mentioned, through entities that are creating you know, solutions at the country level. So, so it also depends on the needs that those countries have, right? And what is their, their, their matrix of energy and how we could support them. So, so there's not one size fits all. So we are trying to be very country driven, as I mentioned, but we are investing across the entire value chain of the energy, uh, of the renewable energy of what you just said. Um, how can you connect with me? Either uh, ping me on LinkedIn, um, uh, or I'll put I'll be putting my email uh, uh, in the chat in a, in a few minutes. Uh, thanks for that, June. Over to you. Hi, Henry. Thank you for the talk. I actually had a follow up um, to the adaptation investment question. So yeah. a, a couple of years ago, I was doing some interviews with um, local groups that have are, are somewhere on the accredited entity pipeline or are in the process of preparing projects on adaptation. And one theme that kept coming up was the, the burden of proof to show that an impact that is being addressed is indeed climate change related. And how difficult that is if you're in a country where there isn't a baseline historical observation or climate modeling. So have you found, um, what are some ways that's in impacting the projects that you're seeing in the adaptation pipeline? Do you find that there's a lot more that you're seeing in terms of early warning systems and investing in data gathering information systems when and how do you balance that trade-off? Because there are areas where impacts are there, they might just not be able to show it's climate change. Sure. Thanks, June. Uh, very good question. And actually this burden of proof also was very tough by the independent assessment panel that we use um, because they were also asking for a lot of data. Uh, the board approved an updated climate impact potential paper last year, and this policy, which is available in our website, became provided a lot more flexibility on the use of indigenous uh, knowledge and also of the use of proxies that could be established in large data sets like the IPCC or others. Because I, I think, as you mentioned, countries do not have especially some of the countries that are the more vulnerable, do not have those 30 year data uh, that some uh, of our technical people were asking, especially the external panel. So I think with this, uh, this has allowed uh, countries to overcome some of those, I would say heavy requirements. From our side, uh, June, we also are helping countries or projects as they come through us with technical assistance. Um, in case they could access, but they don't have the resources, we are able to provide them with grants, um, the either project preparation grants where the climate uh, or the adaptation uh, beneficiary assessment could be paid outside of the project. And we're able to bring the expertise through a roster of consultants or a roster of experts. So those are some of the solutions that we have tried to put in place to make sure that we're not um, limiting the opportunity for access of our capital, given those, um, you know, the, the difficulties of managing those data, um, that, that information. So I hope that answers your question, Jim. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Uh, relating to that question, but kind of going another level to uh, the institution level. Uh, it's very really interesting that, you know, your slide, you know, you are talking about uh, this is how much is invested, this is how much carbon is, you know, mitigated and so on. Uh, so, uh, and then you already mentioned, you know, like how, how GCF is measuring the impact at the project level how the impact that GCF is generating as a institution is being evaluated. Like you mentioned how much money that you deployed and then how much money that you have catalyzed. 
but uh, is there any other like measures that GCF is using to to show the impact that GCF's uh, projects are generating? Sure. So from a from a project perspective, remember we are a second level funder. So we fund through entities. Those entities have their own impact management systems, um, and that's things that they have. We we always get we're very simple in what we're looking for because on the mitigation we want to have quantifiable reduction of emissions because this is linked to the NDC. So every project, we have a mitigation impact assessment tool. And here we know that, you know, what we're looking is to that number, what, how many tons, how many metric tons of CO2 reduction are we able to see as they get in this project. And on the on the on the adaptation side is number of beneficiaries. Um, so so this is at the project level. But I believe our impact beyond the reduction of emissions and beyond the resiliency and access of beneficiaries is on our role in the climate finance architecture. How many you know? How many was? How many early stage funds? Are we able to test in the market? Uh, you know, how much are we accelerating the market and the financing in the market? How many private investors are we able to crowd in? How much are we able to de risk in an industry to make it commercially viable or market viable? Uh, how many, um, you know, how much capacitation are we transferring to countries? So countries could really translate their NDCs into proper investment plans. Um, you know, how, how are we uh, helping entities green their own operations by being able to enhance their, their portfolio? Uh, so we believe that there is this transformational element of working with GGCF because we're able to take a lot of those risks that elsewhere people are not taking. And hopefully we are, you know, doing this. Now we are this sort of, you know, ecosystem building uh, and ecosystem enhancement is not being measured per se. I mean, maybe one measure is the mobilization of private capital and the leveraging of our public money into total uh, money for raised for the fund. Uh, but for me, this could even be as important than the actual mitigation and adaptation targets for KPIs, because this is what is creating a market. Um, so, so for us, this is if, if we, I mean, here, as I said, we could take so many high risks that if we fail, 30% of our portfolio fails, that's not to me a signature of failure. Because if we tried and then we we're able to de-risk and we were able to prove and then others improved it, I think there is a huge <clears throat> upside to that. So, so, so I think there are two levels. We've got the, the, the measurable clearly, but we have this other sort of ecosystem building and enabling environment building that I think uh, we are playing, I would say, a very important role. Possibly um, one that if we do it right with our partners uh, would help create the, the market that I think we're trying to create. Um, and then it's, Good point that you raised that you are actually working with your uh, the accredited institutions, and your accredited institutions are are various. You know, like they are very diverse, as I saw. Yep. Like they're multilateral, bilateral, even private sector. Like in your view, like how you know, like a working with a different type of organizations look like you know it's also kind of like a li relating to the governance of the blended finance yeah. you know I, I assume that you know every project working with different organization might be different but uh you know by that category like how how your approaches are different and then how your setups in blended finance are differentiating yeah so um you you said it rightly right we have a very heterogeneous uh set of entities so we have 114 entities, but we also have other, what we call delivery partners. 
that provide technical assistance. We've got about 200 partners altogether. Um, listen, I think it's a privilege. Uh, I mean, very few funds have this plethora of partners. Um, you know, UN agencies give us a lot of access because they are in country. We are based in Korea only. Mm -hmm. We don't have country representation at the moment. So uh, through the UN, we're able to have, I would say, good outreach. Um, and they have good experience in project management. Um, through the MDBs, the multilateral development banks, we are working in leveraging capital. Um, and they also have in-country presence. They also have very strong technical knowledge. So when we work with the World Bank or we work with some of those entities, we are able to leverage both knowledge and, and local presence. With the NGOs, so we work with Conservation International, the Nature Conservancy, WWF. Um, I mean, they bring a lot of, um, I would say, track record, especially in biodiversity or in some of the uh, uh, nature-based solution space. So for us, that is a great uh, partnership to have. Um, impact investors like Acumen, they bring that sort of, you know, blended finance experience, but also that focus in, in really making a difference. So Acumen is actually working on a project with us to, to what we call the harbors to reach, which is working with the 800 million people in Africa that have no access to electricity. So this is not a, a project of clean energy per se, it's a project of energy access, home-based solar systems, et cetera. So they're tr really trying to really make something commercially viable, but working with those that are excluded. So I think the impact investors bring that. The private equity uh, partners or the commercial banks, they bring to us that knowledge of financial instruments, that uh, big outreach of capital markets. Um, so, so, you know, I think every, every single entity or cluster of entities um, will provide, I would say, that um, enhancement so that our capital can go further um, and that our impact could also be bigger. So honestly, I think this is, um, I mean, I used to work, as, as you said, at, I work at the World Bank, I work at the UN, I worked uh, at, at Morgan Stanley, I worked in responsibility, which is a large impact investor. So in this year, I'm with one job, I'm able to have all of those, <laughs> whereas in the past, I had to go to different jobs to be able to get that exposure. So I think this is some, maybe one of our, I would say, unique um, value proposition. Thank you. Um, do we have a question? No, Bruce was actually talking about the U.S. investment uh, into the fund. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Yes, we also are very grateful and we welcome the announcement by President Biden that the U.S. Uh, was contributing a billion dollars. Um, so actually, we hope that this money is going to come in at the end of this month. Um, and we're already, actually, the call that I have in six minutes is we're going to be discussing pipelines for our October board meetings. We would like to use that money into, into that. Um, and, and, and you were right. Uh, some of the issues on climate that I just mentioned are not exclusive of the developing countries. I also believe that in developed countries, you face similar barriers. Um, we don't invest in developed countries because the uh, Paris Agreement is, is, as you know, a bit of a compensation agreement um, of, of how developed countries who are the high emitters support developing countries who are having the biggest brunt of the impact and they were not responsible for that. So that's why our mandate is to only invest in those countries. But with some of our peers that we are working, some of these accredited entities, they also have portfolios in developed countries. And we hope we hopefully cross-fertilize some of those. Um, we are very uh, focused now, actually last night and tonight, we're having our second consultation meeting for potential contributors for GCF2. GCF2 is the next programming cycle of 2024 to 2027. And we are getting very positive feedback. This is not the easiest year to fundraise because of the Ukraine crisis and because of uh, everything that is going on at the macro level. But we hope to have either another 10 to $12 billion in the next refinancing. 
So we really uh, hope, hope, hopeful to um, get all our contributors. Our largest contributors are the UK, is the number one, followed by Japan, France, Germany, and the US. Um, and those are our top five. If you look at what they've contributed, they contributed each somewhere between three and $2 billion. Um, the US uh, um, pledge in our initial, initial recent mobilization during the Obama administration, they pledged three billion, but they had only been able to pay one billion because during the Trump administration, there was no payments. And then now the Biden administration was able to honor to another billion. There's still one billion pending. We don't know when that will come, but uh, it's already one point whatever. So I would like to thank all the taxpayers from some of the <laughs> distribution countries because we are able to do this thanks to you because this is public money. That's why we want to make sure that we use it in the best way possible. June, I'll be taking your question as the last one and then I'll be wrapping up over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it was also regarding like fundraising and replenishment discussions. Um, if you could comment a little bit about the loss and damage discussions and how you anticipate that being useful in um, fundraising efforts going forward. I'm glad you brought that question. Um, actually, the Secretary General uh, sent us a very nice speech where he's calling all countries, especially G7 countries, to replenish the Green Climate Fund, but he also said to make the loss and damage fund operational. Um, so while our mandate is to have uh, uh, a balance between adaptation and mitigation, we have um, we could account that about 30% of our projects have a loss and damage angle. Because when you, when you talk about loss and damage, you're talking about um, minimizing, averting, and addressing loss and damage. You work on these three. So the addressing is the area that we're not doing because that is more the emergency funding. So addressing is the Pakistan crisis happened, how do we set up a fund that will go into Pakistan very quickly to manage that? We don't have that agility, unfortunately. We have board meetings three times a year. We need to go to the board to approve it. We don't operate, we do not operate in a, in a, in a sort of humanitarian crisis type of business. But the projects on early warning that I just presented to you, that is actually minimizing and averting. Um, some of our insurance projects could also do a little bit of addressing, but also of, 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 of mitigating, right, uh, or, 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 or diminishing or minimizing some of them. So we believe that there are some tangible, you know, some tangential uh, loss and damage uh, impact that we do. However, the loss and damage fund will be exclusively on loss and damage and mostly focused on addressing. Now, we are an observer to the transitional committee of the loss and damage fund. We're also trying to provide some of our lessons learned of hopefully things they should not do. <laughs> and the issue with the loss and damage is we don't know the sources of capital. So we could think about an amazing fund, but we're talking about three times fast, which is significant. You know, raising this 10 or 12 billion every four years is quite an endeavor and creating an entity and an institution from scratch. Because while we are, a lot of people call us the flagship UN Green Climate Fund. We, are, we were created by COP and we are accountable to the UNFCCC. We're not an independent entity. We are an independent entity based in Korea as Korea wanted to be our host, but we had to start from scratch. We need to negotiate privileges and immunities in every country we operate. We needed to do everything. So we are startup. So there is also the possibility. Could they use some of our back office to create the loss and damage? And, and the loss and damage could be somehow supported by GCF or powered by GCF. Um, that might be something they could consider. But for that, we need to have a separate window of funding and also operations because without business model, we will not be able to operate. 
So we are engaged. Let's see what this happens. I mean, COP28, we will see the results. It's been a pleasure to address the Stanford and Kai students and community. I would like to thank So Yung and Katie for the invitation. I will be sharing the slides uh, with, uh, with both of you. So you can yeah. also share it with the rest of the attendees. And my email is there. My LinkedIn profile is easily found. Um, I hope this, uh, you know, sparked some interest uh, as you are exploring climate finance further.